So let's start our panel discussion with the Jan Philip Albert, Robi Stekelum, Rares Voitru, and Anna Iafisco. Please welcome them here in the floor to discuss all these ideas with them. So all, all over Europe, we have young people struggling to find the job, meeting their expectations and expertise. And when they can finally find this job, they are still struggling to pay the rent, to be able to live in a, in, a, in a decent apartment, and they are struggling to develop their personal and professional life. And we need to deal with this because it's a huge problem, and now the root causes of this problem are, I think, many and many different. Jan, you as yourself, you are a young politician, you started your political career at a very early stage. What's, which were the challenges you met and how you can see this, you know, this developing until now? I think the, the most important challenge was that uh, the times were changing so fastly and things uh, were uh, changing also structurally so fastly that the political decision makers didn't really get it a long time quickly enough. When it comes to the climate crisis, which we just heard of, when it comes to like digitization and the way of change of how we communicate with each other, but also when it comes now about the com completely changed way of how we are working and living in society, especially young people today face completely different ways of how to create their life and also how to, uh, um, uh, to do their jobs than some decades ago. And this problem of a gap between what is perceived and what is the reality led to a loss of trust of young people also in political decision makers. Because you feel when people don't get the point, you know. And I think that uh, when you see studies that in the age group uh, under 22, there is uh, only, I think, in, a, in an OECD survey, 37% trust uh, in, in political leaders. That's really a devastating result, you know. So we need to make sure that... Um, uh, political leaders and parties and also the structure in which we take political decisions are upholding to the rapid changes in society, which are just there. We can't just say, oh, they don't happen and, um, and things are just like they are and they were for decades and centuries. We have to take care uh, that the things have changed and therefore also the challenges might be different than uh, most of the political leaders uh, perceive. Uh, do you think that we have enough young people in the political scene in order to portray all this problem that you just mentioned? To start on a positive note, I think that today there are much more young political representatives than 20 years ago. When I, I entered the European Parliament with, with 26 years, uh, I was one of very few young people back then. Today, there is much, many more in the European Parliament. Back then, I was like traveling to the US and the people were looking at me like an alien uh, because uh, no one would imagine, for example, in Congress back then to be uh, under 50 or something. You know? So um, uh, that changed too now. So you see it, it's also globally, there is a change uh, in representation, but it doesn't mean uh, that only because there is a higher representative share, um, the structural understanding also of leadership of political parties has happened already. It is on the go, but parties are slow, institutions are slow, and all of them take place in an existing um, structural power setting. And uh, it takes some time for this to be changed. And that's uh, in, in this time, you always need to counterweigh that structural imbalance and, uh, and gap. Thank you. Uh, Robbie Stakelum, Head of Policy Advocacy in a Social Platform. You've been working on these issues like years now. Are we in a better place or not? <laughs> um, I think that depends on if you're an optimist or a pessimist. Uh, so the optimist in the room would say that in the last three years, poverty has stabilized which in a sense is a good thing considering everything Europe has been through 
in the last three years. Uh, I'm <laughs> a little bit more of the pessimist and the cynical, so I would say that we have a commitment to lift 15 million people out of poverty by 2030, and if we're stagnating now, that's not progress. Um, we have a, the Lisbon Declaration, which says we are trying to eradicate homelessness by 2030, and again, if we're stagnating for three years, mm. that's not progress. But even if you look underneath the data of poverty, the, for the lowest income quartile, and here I'm including students, uh, young people who are in precarious work, who are on minimum, in, or minimum income, minimum hour contracts or other forms of precarious work, for those people, the situation is much worse. Energy poverty is rising. Financial distress is at the highest level since 2013 after the last recession and severe and material deprivation levels are also increasing. So uh, I would say the situation is not very good and beneath the surface it's getting, it is definitely getting much worse. Do we have developed policies? Because we see now new crises occurring all the time, wars, energy crises. Have we developed policies that actually can deal with this problem and is anybody eager to actually implement these policies at a higher level? Yeah, they're two very different questions. Yes, we have the policies, but do people want to implement them is a very different question. So one thing that we've been calling for in Social Platform is a framework directive on minimum income. Um, there is a recommendation on minimum income, but what we know from the last 30 years of experience is that soft law measures to tackle poverty generally don't work. They're not really taken up. And even if you look at the current proposal or what's on the table when it comes to minimum, minimum income, and if you see how it's rolled out in some member states, there are many issues. Uh, for example, in the majority of countries that have minimum income schemes, if you're in it, you are still living below the poverty line, which defeats the purpose of having minimum income. But also, they disallow in many countries young people from accessing minimum income. And so I think a framework directive can be a way to put at a high European level what we need to be able to address poverty and lift people out. But it goes broader than that. I think if you look at protection systems in general, they discriminate against young people. Not all young people can access social benefits. Not all young people can access housing benefits or fuel allowances. Um, young people are in situations where they have, um, like I said earlier, zero hour contract, precarious work, different levels of minimum wage even. And so when you look at rising fuel poverty, severe material deprivation and financial distress, of course that's disproportionately going to impact on young people because they are already in this vulnerable situation because the laws that we've enacted don't adequately protect them. So that's a huge area um, to be developed. Thank you. Uh, Raris Wojcu, do I pronounce you? you are, I think you are the younger among, uh, among us. So how all these problems we just described actually impact, have an impact on you and your generation? So today I'm here to speak from an institutional perspective, right? Like from an organizational perspective, I represent European Youth Forum. Um, we are the largest democratic youth platform in Europe. We represent over 100, it's, it's an ad that I need to do, you know? Yeah, sure. Over 100 youth organizations, both national youth councils, international non-government youth organizations, and youth political parties, such as um, FYEG. Um, and I mean, I'm, of course, m most of what I'm going to talk about today is going to be based on data and research and analyses and, and policy briefs and so on. But it's impossible for me not to tie my own personal experience into this as a young person who has moved away from home less than two years ago. Um, and so I have great faith in what I'm going to say, not only because we have an amazing policy and research team at the Youth Forum, but also because I've lived through most of this myself. Um, so I would say when we look at, at the, the, the impact that's independent and um, um, inadequate independent living measures have on young people, we see this all across the board when it comes to, to, to social inequalities. Um, young people do not have the right conditions, the minimum right conditions that they need to be able to, to make whatever decisions that they need for themselves. And this is not, we're not talking about deci making decisions to, to, to um, live lavishly or to live luxuriously. We're talking about reaching, indeed, that, that minimum um, poverty line, that minimum access to services, access to their rights, to health, to, to uh, social services. Um, and when we look at the, at the background of it, we are indeed stagnating, and we're stagnating at a... I saw the word being used earlier, so I don't mind using it, right? At a 
freaking disastrous point. One in four young Europeans are at risk of poverty and social exclusion. So if we look around the room right now, and we say that there's 30 of us in the room right now, at least eight or nine of us would be at risk of poverty and social exclusion, just to give us a, um, an idea. So this is, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a disastrous moment to, to stagnate. Um, and actually, we're focusing a lot at the European Youth Forum on mental health as well. And I wanted to ask you, because research suggests that 49% of young people have issues when it comes to accessing mental health services. So I just want to ask you really quickly, how many of you have faced these, these issues? So how many of you have faced issues in trying to access mental health services? Yeah, so this is what we're talking about. So it is indeed... Um, a huge issue, and we cannot talk about, um, about poverty, about social inequalities, if we do not talk about it in, in an intersectional manner. So all of these issues, lack of access to rights, lack of access to, to a, a basic, um, a basic minimum, um, minimum income, which in some states is, age, in most states actually, it is age discriminatory, because it is only given to, to those above 18 in most states, in some states above 25, and in the outcasts, sorry to call them out, but not really, Denmark and Cyprus, above 28. You receive minimum income if you're above 28 years old. That is absolutely <coughs> insane. So I have a lot of statistics here about how we're, how we're falling short and how we're falling behind. Um, I could list them all all day, but you know, we, we, we all know this. Um, let's do a little throwback Thursday, even though it's Saturday. If you, if you remember the last global economic crisis and what followed afterwards were austerity measures. So between 2010 and 2015, we saw a gross package of austerity measures across member states, which drastically cut investment in public services, access to healthcare, access to education, access to employment services. And what we're seeing right now, and it's, it's really true what you're saying about the fact that young people are, are disenchanted and are not interested in taking part in democratic processes, do not trust democratic institutions. Research shows that after COVID, 45% of young people do not trust the government. I mean, that's absolutely insane. And it happens because during these times of crises, young people not only feel that the, the governments don't listen to them and don't understand them, we also feel that they do not represent us and that they do, well, to put it plainly, nothing for our well-being. And so at the end of the day, what we're seeing um, uh, as a cascading effect uh, from what happened in the, in the um, grand years of austerity, 2010-2015, is political disenchantment, radicalization, which is a, going to be a great issue, as we all know, at the, at the next um, EU elections, and of course, just pure uninterest in political and democratic processes, which is, I'm sure, as we all know, even though all of us here in the room are politically engaged and we are working for a political cause one way or another, for the rest of our peers, that's not even remotely a reality. So I think it's super important for us to be aware of that also when campaigning for the European, uh, for the European elections. Um, so to sum it all up, I would say um, we're not doing great, but we have this humongous opportunity next year with EU elections. Really, I mean, use, this to f use your frustrations to fuel your campaigning efforts, to, to fuel your, your uh, grassroots work. And this is not going to be here forever. We have an opportunity to change it. Thank you. Uh, Ana yeah, Fisco. Yeah. You're the Eurocities Policy Officer on Social Affairs and Economy. And sometimes we feel that cities where most of the young people want to go or live right now are kind of hostile, mostly because of the affordable housing, the lack of the affordable housing, actually. Uh, what are you doing about it? And how's your view about how can cities actually become a better place uh, for young people. So, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I represent the voice of uh, 200 cities around Europe today. And yes, cities are places of high living standard, but uh, they are also places of greater inequalities and segregation. And this is even um, more accentuated when it comes to young people. Um, the Gen Z and the millennials have experienced, have gone through um, a lot of crises uh, from the financial crisis uh, uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic and then to the war in Europe and the, co the current cost of living crisis. And of course, uh, um, these polycrisis scenarios, uh, it targets young people, especially when it comes to housing costs and mental health issues. 
Um, why? Because there is no regulation about short-term rentals. There is uh, no regulation for real estate investors. Uh, and this is something that affects the housing markets, of course. Uh, and municipalities are trying to regulate autonomously now, but it's very difficult if there is no regulation at European level. And there is also lack of supply of social and affordable housing. And um, as you were saying, this is due to uh, budgetary strain that it comes from uh, a wrong, uh, austerity, wrong austerity measures that have been put in place since the financial crisis in 2018. Muni municipal budgets are, are stretched. They cannot do much about it. They don't have the funds to invest in, in public housing. Um, and uh, I have a couple of examples uh, uh, from cities which are suffering from this. And one of these is, for instance, Milan. Um, I'm Italian. I come from the south. Uh, most of my peers moved from my hometown to the north, especially to Milan. But even after the graduation and students also, they are not, they are not capable of, afford, of, of, of living there, of living in a decent house now. Um, so um, basically there is this income stagnation while um, uh, housing prices almost doubled in the past eight years. Uh, salary is also only grown by 5%. Um, and that is, that is frightening, of course. And this is also what is happening in Dublin. There, are, there is a lack of housing, and young people now are moving, uh, are, are moving in the outskirts of, of the cities, or they are just moving outside. They are going into uh, remote areas of, uh, of Ireland, uh, because living in cities is not affordable anymore. Um, of course, municipalities are trying now to put in place some measures uh, to renovate their buildings, uh, and uh, um, that will be given uh, to low-income people. Um, so Dublin is doing this, but another measure uh, that is being put in place by, uh, by Milan is to work directly with the employer and provide them with uh, incentives to renovate public housing because there are some there are some buildings that are just derelict. They need to be renovated. That is the main issue. Um, but of course, uh, there is a need to work with the, with the private sector on this. And all these causes also brain drain. Um, so I, as I was saying, young people are moving uh, are now moving abroad from from cities. And uh, um, this is what it, it will cause brain drain and shift uh, in, economic, in, in, in the economic productivity of cities. Uh, and for instance, uh, um, from the latest poll uh, in, uh, in London, people aged between 25 and 39, they are all willing to mo move out because uh, they cannot afford the mortgage or a rent in the in the city, which used to be the city that most of all was attracting uh, uh, young talents, not only from the UK but also from all over the world. Um, and then, I mean, all uh, it's not only about housing per se; it's also about the quality of housing because there is a direct link. There is a straight link between living in a in a good house and also like the the success of of a child to thrive in the in in his or her life uh, so when it comes to energy poverty the lack of uh, of insulation of the building the poor quality of of eating these all affect the, the mental health and well-being of 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 children and their ability to thrive during their whole life. Um, so yes, cities are also acting in this sense. They are putting in place measures to also involve citizens in the retrofitting of the housing stock. But uh, you know, we need 
we need funds. Uh, there is a lack of financing uh, to deliver the green transition uh, that has to be addressed. Thank you. <laughs> so let's grab our phones and let's, uh, let's answer a couple of questions. Here you will see the instructions. Uh, you need to go to enter the Menti website and tell us if you think so. From which country did you come to, to Thessaloniki? I know some of the answers, but yes, okay. <laughs> Turkey, France. Wow, Germany. All from all, oh, come on, guys. We're from all over Europe here. Spain, Armenia, Lithuania, Portugal, Belgium. Oh, yeah, I can see a heart. Oh, yes, Portugal, Italy, United Kingdom. <laughs> we have a size challenge here. <laughs> okay, perfect. So let's go to the next question. So what do you feel when someone mentions independent living? Okay, now I'm curious to see the replies. Yeah. It's a dream. Ho hopefully it's become fulfilled. Anxiety and affordable housing, not possible. Science fiction. I want to meet. I want to meet the people who answered, who gave this answer. Stability, emancipation. Yeah, not starving to death. I was talking to a lady who told me she's renting like a 30 square meters apartment in, in center of Athens, and it costs almost 500 euros. And I was like, <clears throat> fairy tale. Okay, thank you for all these answers. Let's go to the next question and the final for this mentee. Round starts independent living starts with yeah. <laughs> <laughs> money, 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 rule the world. All right, thank you, thank you for this. How, I mean, your first impression on the, on the answers they just, all these people gave? Jan? I think it's obvious that um, uh, for many people, uh, especially young people at the moment, uh, it, there is, as it was mentioned, anxiety. Uh, and I think that's very important because anxiety obviously is something which is uh, leading society into depression. And um, so we need to get a perspective. Uh, and the question comes up, what will be the perspective for the future? Also in participation uh, in the, the wealth of society. And I think when we are now entering into a phase where many things are changing, also due to the ecological crisis, but also due to economic competitiveness in the world uh, and changes of economy, uh, economic actors and so on, and the jobs which we are doing, the question comes up, how do I participate in the new wealth of the future, in the new uh, economic situation of the future, which we will have to build together and that should be in the core of the political debate. Uh, it's not that people are not willing to change and to adjust to new developments and new surroundings. But the question is, is there still solidarity and community in the way how we act together as society in the future? And how, how do we assure that? My impression is that um, the, the national governments and structures which we're having 
uh, obviously over the last decades failed to give that perspective. So we need to, uh, at least in Europe, get on a cross and uh, supranational level an answer to that. And there, looking at the elections and the next European Commission, for example, we come to the point that we still maybe have insufficient competencies and possibilities to get effective decisions on a higher level. Because, for example, the question of incomes, the question of uh, finances, the question of um, rules for housing or living costs and so on, is very much decided still on a national level, but it's hard to, um, uh, to build a perspective only on that level because economy and the whole situation in which we are is just cross-border and still also more and more, more global. And I think that's one of the things where young people have to insist on that uh, the, the way uh, how we are addressing uh, this perspective and the participation in wealth that this is decided also at least on the European level in a more uh, structured way and in a more effective way. Uh, Robbie, people here are also pessimistic, as you, you see. Uh, a comment on this, I mean, where is the way out? <laughs> where is the way out? I, th I mean, it's nice to be in a room with other people who are pessimistic for a change, because sometimes I feel like other people live in a dreamland. Um, I think the issue is, for me, it's obvious what was on that screen, but the problem is for a lot of policymakers, they either don't want to hear it, uh, or they just disengage from the conversation. Um, I don't want to be like very negative uh, at this conference, but I genuinely am very fearful for what comes in the next 12 to 18 months. I think what we're looking at on the horizon is, I don't think it's going to be good for social Europe. Um, I am a huge supporter of the Green Deal, and we've worked really closely, particularly with the European Greens, uh, on having really good... Um, backstops in place on the social side of the Green Deal, but the problem is a lot of the right-wing parties don't want to talk about anything related to social when it comes to the Green Deal. And I think if you think housing is a challenge at the moment, wait for another two years, because we will have ETS2, which is a carbon tax on energy. Uh, where do young people predominantly, predominantly live? You live in probably what you tend to be the the worst quality housing because you have the worst pay conditions and social protections. Those housings are the ones that have the worst energy efficiency. The Energy Performance of Building Directive is going to mandate that those houses get renovated by 2030. Obviously, that is a good thing and it is good for the environment. Who's going to pay for that? Your landlord is going to pass that payment on to you as a tenant and that is going to trigger a whole wave of renovations or renovation wave is what we're calling them across Europe, when people can't afford to live in the poorest housing, where are they going to go? We talk about the Social Climate Fund, but <laughs> everything, everything is being put into the Social Climate Fund, and there is just not going to be enough resources to help everybody who needs it the most. Um, the other thing linked to the Green Deal that I'm very concerned about is ETS2. Um, it is effectively a carbon tax, and for a lot of middle-income, higher-income households, you, of course, can cut back in different areas of your life. If you're a young person who's in uh, precarious work, if you're on low wages, if you're below a minimum wage, how are you going to be able to afford increases in your energy costs when you have added uh, costs in other areas of your life? It's... It's something that I think policymakers at a European level who are designing these policies, they're really not giving enough thought as to how this is going to be implemented on the ground. I'm a huge supporter of the Green Deal, but it also it has to be sustainable. And I'm not sure what we're seeing at the table is going to be sustainable in the future. If you look at comments from the French and German government over the last four weeks, they're already rowing back on the phasing out of gas boilers. They're rowing back on energy performance of buildings directive standards because they are beginning to see that what they are proposing is going to hurt the lowest income quartile to the point where it does risk social unrest. And so I don't want to be incredibly negative. I think there are some positive things that we, things that we can look for. Within the Just Transition Fund, for me, the Just Transition Fund, it's not just, it's not doing enough, but Article 8 of the Just Transition Fund regulation, it does allow for social investment, but no member state has used it for that. They're using it for jobs and skills, which is important, but they're not thinking about the bigger picture. 
The staff, I mean, it's very tedious and boring, but the Commission staff working document on the just transition, it specifically highlights youth. It specifically highlights the impact the just transition will have on youth and that the needs and voices of young people need to be taken into consideration. But if you go to, if you go to the territorial just transition plans, there's nothing on youth. The member states aren't doing anything on it. Bankwatch, if you're interested, have a really good analysis of the existing plans. And they point to the fact that there's nothing on youth, and in the minority of plans where they have something on youth, it's tokenistic. They say young people are very important. And? And what? Like, you don't have anything on the table to include their voices or to follow up on that. And I think going forward to end it, so I think that's one area that we should be focusing on, is trying to get the social and the youth perspective into the Just Transition Fund. And then when it comes to the Social Climate Fund, I think we need to be calling for more money going into it um, and more guidance uh, from the member states or from the commission to the member states. Because maybe this is why I'm a pessimist, maybe I've been around a little bit too long in EU policy making, but uh, a number of years ago, the Court of Auditors, again, very tedious, had a report on the Youth Guarantee. And what they found is the youth guarantee, while it was great, it did not reach the most vulnerable and it did not reach the most marginalised young people. It went predominantly to middle income uh, young people and that it failed to reach to those who arguably need it the most. And when I look at these policy initiatives, I fear we're going down the same road again where we're not going to get to the people that really need it the most and that they will be the most impacted. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, Rares, do, ha, is it easy actually to motivate all these young people to actually try to push for this political change that we are talking about and it's absolutely necessary in order to push the youth agenda forward? So, I mean, there's a huge gap between us and policymakers. That much is clear to us. So, of course, when you, I mean, of course, you're here, you're politically engaged, you're politically active, you're activists, you, 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 this is what you're passionate about. So, for most of us here, it's, it's self-obvious, like, of course I'm going to do this, of course I'm going to fight for a better, more just world. But for, for most of our peers who are struggling financially, who do face um, economic inequalities and social inequalities, these kinds of abstract, changing the world um, uh, narratives, they mean absolutely nothing. You know, I mean, it's all about actually managing to, to live from one month to the other, from one week to the other. So I think there is a lack of motivation and we're seeing a lot of disenchantment of all of us towards, towards institutions. Um, but we are, so at, at the Youth Forum, what we're proposing is, is a EU youth test. So basically what this is, um, is a, so it's technically the European Union youth test. Um, it is a, an impact assessment tool which ensures that at a European level, and this kind of model can be implemented at a, at a national level, at a local level, it basically entails that it's based on three pillars. So basically meaningful engagement of young people when creating policies, all policies, because all policies affect us, um, not just youth policies or, or social policies and so on. Um, so actually being engage, engaging young people, engaging youth organizations in creating policies, then doing an impact assessment, you know, so we actually see what the impact of these, of these policies are on young people. And again, we're talking about all kinds of policies, not just the classical youth-related ones. And then after having this impact assessment, a mitigation of the potential uh, negative uh, Im um, impact that, that policies can have on young people. So we're proposing this life cycle approach where young people, you know, we as young people and, and youth organizations are engaged every step of the process. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's not happening right now. And what we're seeing in terms of investment um, is that the, the current fiscal frameworks that we have are so rigid and so focused on, on growth and so focused on production um, that when it comes to investment in social policies and green policies that actually benefit most of society, if not all of society, radio silence. So we're also asking for this flexibilization of, of fiscal rules, of fiscal policies, to be able to have these kinds of, of, of investments. Um, and yeah, I also I wanted to say something about quality employment and um, that, that you also referred to. And the, the minimum basic income for which we currently have those, those age, age discrimination thresholds that I talked earlier um, about. Um, 
Ensuring equality working conditions is a basic human right. I think we can all agree on that. And ensuring that those who are out of work for any reasons have the minimum ability to survive, to live above the poverty line is something that, I mean, to us, again, is self-evident, but it's something that needs to happen in terms of access to social protection, access to social services, to social secur security for, for young people. Um, because what does that give us? You put it very, very correctly on the, on the Menti earlier. It was the biggest one. It gives us freedom, right? So independence, freedom, as you mentioned super importantly earlier, is not only about having you know, constitutions and laws that tell us that we are citizens with fully fledged rights and that we have the right to vote and yada, yada, yada. It's about having the, demo, the civic space and the democratic space and the means to participate in democracy. Right now, democracy is not for everyone. And it's something that we need to work on. Thank you. Anna, we had uh, local and regional elections here uh, the previous Sunday in Greece, and we see not many young people actually participating. Do we need more responsibilities, maybe at the local level, so that we could also engage young people to vote, even for this, the first led stage of um, administration? Yes, I was speaking with uh, Michalis earlier uh, last week about this. Um, I, I think that uh, local level and cities can really act on this. Uh, they are already trying to do so, especially when it comes to the just transition uh, with the participatory budgeting. So basically they are now, uh, I mean, some cities around Europe are trying to um, put citizens together and uh, um, they dedicate some budget to uh, green projects, uh, and it's about citizens. It's citizens who decide where these money are going are going to. And uh, for instance, a lot of regeneration projects have been put uh, in place uh, in uh, in Bologna, and they have this participatory budgeting. And in each of the neighborhoods, uh, each of the municipalities in the um, um, in the uh, metropolitan area of Bologna um, are being uh, put in place and it's decided by citizens. But which was the problem in that case? It was reaching out to the most vulnerable, to the marginalized communities, to migrants and refugees, to young people, to women. Um, uh, and that is always the issue uh, that Robbie was mentioning before. It's about reaching these people. Uh, and it's difficult even for local governments when they don't have the data. Uh, sometimes uh, we still need another level, an intermediate level between uh, the local governments and the citizens, even, even when we say that we are the closest level to citizens. Uh, and in this case, uh, uh, cities uh, and directors, officers from cities are telling me, Sometimes we have to rely on social workers. Uh, those are the person who know who's, who is facing difficulties. Uh, they know the people uh, that uh, cannot pay energy bills, uh, that uh, need help in terms of uh, um, childcare, um, and. I mean, it's it's very difficult also for, for the local government to find innovative solutions to reach out to the young, to reach out uh, to the most vulnerable. Thank you. So let's, uh, let's open the floor to your questions. I mean, I'm really looking forward to see what you'd like to ask to all these brilliant people we have here. Okay, I'm a journalist, I'll start. <laughs> <clears throat> so I understand that somehow there are the funds out there, but it's not the political willingness to allocate them, putting as a priority the well-being of young people. And is, are the elections the only way forward to change that? Jan. I think that, first of all, really a very important description of the situation, that it's a matter of priorities. We have uh, constraints in budgets, 
it's just like it is. But still, it's a matter of priority how to really decide what you're going to do and what not. And um, I think that it's needed that young people get engaged in the global question on priority setting. And by the way, it's not only priorities in distributing or redistributing money, but also in particular priorities and, and mingling into the question how the economic model uh, of our societies will be built. Like, what's the wealth, what we want to build, you know? Uh, we, we shouldn't be too, or you should be too, uh, shouldn't be too defensive to just say, we young people want to share of what's there, but you, you should really make clear what's the kind of wealth model and, and economic model we want to build and where do we want to get perspectives built because that it's also about investments then in this, uh, these areas. And there we come to the point where I also agree that maybe the possibilities to show what's possible on the local level are far bigger to, to really uh, um, get forward because it's more concrete. It's not needing a com complete overhaul in general, but you can be flexible in trying things out and you get ownership of people. People can like touch and see it also. And there I think there is very huge uh, good examples everywhere in Europe where you can see that local communities find solutions. For example, for housing. I mean, even things which are not regulating at all, like just asking older people living in larger flats to maybe change to a smaller one and they just they are just not doing it because maybe it's economically even negative for them. So to make deals which makes it possible to just swap for young people or families uh, to, to get uh, into housing or um, incentivizing uh, people to get together in communities to start projects, infrastructure projects, social projects, even on mobility, for example. There, there could be so many things to be done without only doing the political framework right. And um, there I really think that this moment of disengagement maybe can be overcome because then you see, okay, that's something for me and I can really do it, make a difference with others together. I have a good experience with it. But there we come to the point of priorities again. It only works if there's at least some money being invested in infrastructure helping these people to do that in the communities. And that should be the priority, for example, in the Just Transition Fund to fund projects on a local or regional level where people get engaged in building something up to solve the problems the best they can. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I think coming back to the original question about the elections, I think they are obviously like a, a watershed moment every five years and they are incredibly important. I don't think what we have on the table for the Green Deal would have been possible if we didn't have this green wave five years ago because uh, it put a whole new emphasis onto the European Commission that something had to be done and there was momentum. But it's the period between the elections that are also incredibly important, where probably a lot of our organisations need to play a very critical role in making sure that what's done is done well and done in a kind of a, a more socially just way. There are kind of two other factors. I think one thing you just raised, Jan, was the economic model. I think that's really important. And again, I think one of the challenges maybe the social sector has had in the last number of years engaging with the Green, New, the green Deal is it's outside of our remit. So it's taken a little while for social NGOs and the social sector to get really engaged in the Green Deal. But at the same time, in, in that environmental and social policy has traditionally been separated. But the same is true of economic policy. Economic policy is separated at a European level from the social side. And you know, if we talk about the economic model, Again, I don't want to be this really boring person on the panel talking about these processes, but the economic governance review is ongoing at the moment, which is really about how do we, how do we, how do European economies function? And what's on the table is not good for social, because what will happen is if what is being proposed and what is wanted by the member states and the council level, that is going to really inhibit member states from investing in social and investing in youth and investing in the just transition. And what will happen if we have these really strict rules is we are going to repeat the same mistakes we made in 2008, because member states will have no choice but to start cutting 
um, social welfare, housing benefits, um, and other really, really essential social protection systems, and they won't have the space to invest in social in the just transition and in the green infrastructures that we need. Um, so that was one area. And the other thing I want to pick up on was something that somebody mentioned earlier about impact assessments, but I was writing it down. I, I, sorry. Um, is we also need better impact assessments of EU policy making. That's one of the things that drives me crazy about the Social Climate Fund and the Just Transition Fund, is there is no social impact assessment. How can you possibly say how much money we need in the Social Climate Fund when you haven't done an impact assessment on how these, you know, this whole legislative package is going to have on these groups? It, it really, it's, it's, it's really, really poor policy making. Aris and Nana, you mentioned before about this up. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, um, we talk a lot about how youth disengagement is a huge issue, and we talk a lot about how we try to involve youth more, and that's super, super important. But what I found, find a little bit scary is that when youth does get involved, especially in Europe, there's a huge surge of right-wing <coughs> movements, especially in youth. And it's for the exact same reasons that we get involved. It's because they're scared of their futures. It's because they want to get involved. They want to change things. Um, they fight for something they believe in, I guess, which, well, in my opinion, it's kind of weird to believe in the things that they do because I am in, I guess, this green spectrum of um, political beliefs. But how do you deal with that? Because it's, it's youth. They, the, the same arguments that... Um, we have for ourselves to motivate ourselves. We are young, we have energy, we can bring this new thing, we can bring change. It's the exactly same thing for them. So how do you deal with that? It's to everybody, yeah? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. to everybody. Please go go ahead. The more tips, the better, I guess. <laughs> Fantastic question, really. I mean, I don't know, would it be weird to ask for a round of applause for that question? <laughs> No, but no, really, really. Um, so, what I was saying earlier is that we've seen that age of uh, that age of austerity between 2010 and 2015, and that huge um, disengagement of young people from democratic inst institutions would come as a result of that, and radicalization as well. And now it is actually the moment where we're seeing the results of those years and years of austerity and years and years of of, um, of um, disillusionment and, and the disengagement. Um, so within the European Youth Forum, we bring together organization, youth organizations, youth political organizations from all over the, the political spectrum, um, except for the, for the very radical organizations. And what we've understood as an organization that, I mean, of course, for example, um, the, the, the um, liberal organizations have very different political views and very different ideological perspectives on different social issues as opposed to the, to the socialist um, youth parties, for, for example. So what we've done at, at European youth level, um, youth forum level, is we're facilitating dialogues in our internal structures, in our internal um, decision-making bodies, and providing a safe space because what you said earlier, I think it's it's super important that you personally do not agree with with their views and with their political stance. Um, I do, however, doubt that everyone who thinks like you expresses that view the same way that you do. We tend sometimes because we stand so strongly and vi virulently against far right policies, we tend to be very outspoken about them, which in, in, in a very sometimes aggressive manner, which only leads to more polarization. So as counterintuitive as this might sound, it is, I think it's, it's, it's a bitter apple we, we need to, to chew on and, and swallow that we need without legitimizing these kinds of movements and, and so on, we need to start having dialogues. Um, and then again, without providing platforms, without providing any kind of, of, of boost, but we need to understand why our peers, some of our peers, are enticed by these values, by these um, measures that are profoundly anti-social, um, anti-sometimes, of course, human, human rights. Um, so I think it all starts there. Um, it's not easy, naturally, and I actually could not tell you how to, how to do it properly. Um, but yeah, I think polarization is what leads to us being 
to having this division between us and them. Um, maybe just to pick up on this, um, it's also a matter of education and civic engagement. Um, and education, I mean education and raising awareness about the green transition, um, which it's, I mean, it's not happening in some uh, European countries. I can see that in my country, for instance, uh, there is no acknowledgement uh, of uh, what the green transition uh, will mean and how will change in, in better their lives. Uh, uh, people do not know um, what it will mean uh, for their lives. So I guess that is something that we need to address as well. Uh, there, is, there is no European program uh, that uh, uh, can help can raise awareness in uh, in schools at the moment, especially at uh, for very young people as well at in the elementary schools as well. Uh, so I think we need to act in that sense as well. And uh, that starts from when you are a child um, to put like in your brain um, and in your mind what uh, the ecological transition, the energy transition can mean and how we can transform your lives in a better way. Just to add that this might be really one of the central uh, points in the end, how to get uh, away from the anxiousness um, uh, and the reactive, reactionary moment of just safeguarding what you still have as perspective for uh, your life uh, to understanding that there might be uh, a new perspective. There might be hope for a new way how to build up wealth and prosperity in life. Um, I think like a, a journalist this morning just asked me like, will maybe the prosperity for the future generations be worse than the last ones? And I think that's an important question. And I just said, if you look at the decades before, the older generations, there was an automatism to say, I want that my children will have a better life than me. I think that this is so entrenched into society, this view, that we have to have an open talk about it. Because when you look at the e ecological footprint, the footprint here in Europe is far bigger than in many parts of the world and also bigger than in sustainable. So to say, I want my children to have a better life than me cannot mean increasing uh, that footprint, but decreasing it. But can there be a story of a better life or at least also of a sustainable life standard for the future, which is built on a different narrative, on a different perspective, a different story, which is positively showing you a way, is essential um, to then get into dialogue with these people and make them understand that there is a different way than the path which they are on. Uh, and having said that, I, I would still say that while doing that, we need to be very clear that every situation, in whatever situation you might be, it's no justification for hate. It's no justification for intolerance and infringing the safety and dignity of other people. That should be the prerogative of every dialogue. Thank you. <laughs> Robbie, you want a remark, or I think there is one more, two more questions. Yes, the three. Okay, I think the lady for here has the microphone. Yeah. Hello. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much again for the panel. It's been really enticing, and I really like the way you have responded to the previous arguments. My question, especially talking about the multiple elephants in the room, is about. Um, clause number eight of the Just Fund, um, the Just Transition Fund, which was, has been mentioned in the conversation a couple of times. One of the things that is suggested is, you know, um, 
the heavy, um, heavy reliance on fossil fuels and how we should transition outside of them. My main concern is, as the EU, uh, as the EU how can we ensure that this just transition does not have a negative effect on the global south, in the sense that one of the big arguments right now is that lithium batteries require mining that is often infringing on human rights causes, such as in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So how, as the European Greens and the European Green parties can assure that our transition won't cause social unrest in other parts of the world. Thank you. Okay, you know, I, I mean, uh, I, I think it's a very important question you're raising and uh, that is also leading us back to the point of the question before because you can't just answer the situation only for your own perspective, for your own region or country. Uh, you always need to see that the things are interconnected today. And um, uh, it is uh, also one of our work as a political green foundation to address exactly these problems and make sure that whatever we do when building a new economic model, we have to take into account all of these developments, uh, which um, shouldn't mean that we are not moving ahead. It just means that we have to take these views into account, that we have to also get engaged with communities having their struggle on these aspects and trying to find uh, the best way how we can, can get progress. Maybe just this sentence. I know the problem is far bigger than that. We could really talk a long time about that. Just say I, I totally agree with the question and it's a little bit outside of the remit of what I work on. We're very much focused on the EU, but it is something that I don't think we're thinking enough about. I, I'm based in Brussels and if you go down to the Brussels Canal um, any, maybe any day of the week, you will see um, these canal boats that are full of old cars and they're being shipped down to Africa. Um, and they're being resold down there in a different type of economic model. Why? Because in Europe, we've, or in Brussels, we have very strict laws on emissions. And so people have to um, replace their cars. And this is where they're being, so we're, I feel like we're exporting our problem. And we're going to see this issue arise in another area in the world in another 10, 15 years down the line. And I think when we're developing these policies, maybe it comes back to impact assessments. It just comes back to also maybe genuine civil dialogue when we're introducing these policies, that you've got the different stakeholders in the room who can flag and say, actually, this is the issue for youth, or this is the issue for the global south, or this is the consequence that you're not thinking of. Because often, and I'll be an optimist for a change, I genuinely think that policymakers uh, in positions of powers are always trying to do the right thing. I, I do fundamentally believe that, but they can also be very ignorant and they can also not access all the information. And what I found sometimes is we, we talk a lot about civil dialogue in this very abstract space. It's very important. I was at um, a civil dialogue space earlier in this week with a load of NGOs and everybody was saying, oh, how wonderful it was. But I was sat in the room and said, well, this is actually terrible because They've just put 40 people into a room. They are, everyone's saying different things. And I can see the political party that organized it. They're not even taking notes. And so you think, OK, yeah, we're flagging maybe the issue of the global south, but no one's listening. And so it's not just about civil dialogue. It's also about genuine, effective civil dialogue. And one of the things the social platform is calling for uh, in the election, as one of our election campaigns, uh, which we're partnering with the Youth Forum on as well, is uh, to have a framework and a strategy for civil dialogue that these issues that you're flagging are actually addressed in policy making rather than waiting 10, 15 years down the line and saying, God, all of Europe's old cars are now in Africa polluting. Of course they are, but you didn't listen to people 10 years ago when they flagged this. Thank you. Uh, one more, yes, back there. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Thank you. Good, good morning. Um, so far it has been super interesting, this panel, so thank you again. Um, so um, I'm from, from Italy, from Rome, and regional co person of the, the, the Italian Young Greens. Um, and my, my question was, um, starting from the, the point that yesterday we had a workshop, like, again, about uh, youth participation, uh, and I was not surprised, but at the same time surprised on how in all of Europe we have the same, basically all of the same obstacles with different shadows, of course, uh, but um, really the same, um, the same problem of not being listened to, not being considered, the making up of these, these youth councils that then are really, you know, they take decisions and then nobody listens to them. Um, so um, 
the, the, the problem we were discussing also yesterday was like, um, and that I was pointing out, and that I want, want to know your opinion about, is that um, we, we all agree that few, we have a participation problem, um, but a, a step forward, even the few of us who are privileged to participate, because it's also about privilege, um, are excluded. Even the few of us who participated, we have a systemic exclusion. Like you turn on the TV and you see over 50 years old people. You, you turn on, like whatever, it's a systemic one. And also within political parties. So um, how do we really, since we are not listened to and since we need to, like a, an emancipation of our generation clearly and we need our generation in position of power because we cannot just stay, um, I mean, continue just asking to be listened to. It's just enough. We don't have time for this. Um, so how do we make really, um, what, what, what can be the solutions for um, being really considered and being put in eligible positions? Because sometimes we are treated really as quotas. And that's also enough. We don't have time for being just quotas put there so we, we can see that we are considered somehow. So how do we make this? Like, how do we really um, put young people in, 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 the, in the situation of being put, again, in eligible position? How do we really make it? Because our parliaments are old. Like, again, I come from Italy, and this legislature is even worse than the last. The last one, the, the, the average age was 49 years old, now it's 53. This is a huge problem. This is a huge problem. How, how can we be represented by, I mean, so, yeah, yeah thank you. I think for the first question uh, on meaningful engagement of young people in, in politics, um, Previously, I used to be a, a youth trainer with the Council of Europe Youth Department, and I can't remember, pop quiz, I can't remember all the principles in my head, but I know they have a document on like five principles for meaningful participation, and I think that's a really good framework to work with, and to say, okay, if you don't have these five principles, then we're not engaging, because uh, we're only going to be tokenized if we take the platform, because it would be the young person at the end of the panel, that's not good enough, you need to have... Um, the framework, I'm sure if you Google it, it will come across. And I'm also sure the Youth Forum also has really good resources as well on meaningful participation. Um, and the other thing, I feel like people have used um, different language on the panel, so hopefully it's not offensive to anybody, but just call bullshit on it as well. Like so often we sit in a room and we're, we're thinking to ourselves, this is pointless, this is useless. I think it's good to call that out once in a while and to say, actually, I don't feel like this is constructive. and I don't think this is working for us because I, you're, you're not listening to us, you're not taking our perspectives in. Because I again, I think people in those positions think they're doing the right thing. And I don't think we, we're always afraid to be critical and to voice our opinion because we want to be in the room. But fundamentally, what's the point of being in the room if nobody is actually doing something with what you're telling them? I don't know if someone else wants to come in on that one. How many of you have run or are planning on running for political office? Mm. With the blessing of the moderator, can we take one minute for each experience? Uh, I'd like two, two or three experiences in, in the room because I think it, it's, it's super relevant that you brought this up, but I also think a lot of people have very different experiences, so I think it, it's, there is added value in Can the we have the, the experience of the person that just maybe asked the question? Or? Yeah, sure. Yeah? sure. Can he have the microphone? I think. So if you just want to tell us a bit about your, like in one minute about your experience of how it was to run for office as a young person. The, the problem I see is that it's more a systemic one, not in, just in that single election. Yes, I ran for office in the last regional elections because of the, in, because of the electoral system. We, we knew that the, the left coalition was going was gonna to lose because there was not a coalition, basically. Uh, but, but, um, but yes, there is not like... Um, it's really something systemic. Like in every event, we're, we are like something treated like used as for pictures like like and also um but really this is happening like i see it in all of europe like taking the example of so many people and then and again it's systemic like you can see it in really in every field just political parties are one of the many fields in which there is this exclusion and it's like um we, we are not either and, and again with with, with um in politics, depending on the electoral system, th there is always a problem, both if there are already lists, so it's just you don't have to write the name of the preference of the person you're voting, and so th the party is making the lists. 
so maybe you are a quota, so we have 30% of young people into the list of candidates, but they are at the bottom. And also, if they are, if we have to put the name of the, the person to, who, to vote, of course, if we are participating, we are competing, but let's say competing with people who have 50 years of experience in politics, you build preferences in decades. So of course we are starting, I mean, with a disadvantage. How do we feel this disadvantage? Right. Yeah. As a fun fact, uh, there are less um, MEPs um, under 30 in the European Parliament than there are MEPs called Martin. Yes. Um, as a bit of perspective, but about what you were saying. So um, at, at the Youth Forum right now, we're, we're really advocating for um, both so political engagement is done in two ways. First one, the first one is the, the, the direct one, the most accessible one for the general public and for, general, for young people in general, which is voting. We're advocating for lowering the voting age to 16 years old. And do we have any people from Austria, Malta, Greece has, has recently lowered the, the, the voting age to 17, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Italy, so uh, I mean, we're seeing this, this, this progress. Um, and in, on that um, um, kind of... Um, direction where we're seeing progress but when it comes indeed to the involvement and actual placement on on on, on voting lists high up so on, on uh, um, eligible positions we're not doing enough and i agree that there are these um, candidates and these politicians who have been there for decades and who are doing um this this campaigning work for their entire life the advantage of young politicians and young candidates is precisely that you have you have not been doing that so, you know, if, and I mean, I don't know how, to, how else to say this, but if you're um, witty enough, if you're smart enough about your, your, your campaign efforts, and I mean, of course, it's not going to happen once, it's not going to happen twice, but it's also about building this, this, this political profile as a candidate and as a young politician, um, it will happen eventually because you have this link to the grassroots, you have this link to your peers, you are more connected to the people you actually want to represent than those who have been in power for 25, 30 years and are at, 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 at their um, eighth mandate or of senator or, 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 or whatever. Um, so I know it's frustrating. It's This whole system is not built to accommodate us. So just keep putting in the work, keep campaigning and all of like Youth organizations, you said that, um, I, I heard that, that yes, national youth councils are not necessarily, um, they're making decisions and they're not being heard. That's changing. So they're advocating for, for, for your rights. They're doing consultations according to their capacity. And it's, it's becoming more of a unified voice. So I really think we're, we're moving forward. It's slow and it's, it's tedious, but it's happening. So don't lose faith. <laughs> Yeah, sure. <laughs> I would like to uh, emphasize that. Um, and uh, I think that uh, if you look back um, on the history of uh, like misrepresented people in democracies, um, it always take a long time until um, change were also in representation in institutions uh, happening. Uh, and I understand like the notion of we don't have that time, we need to be there now. Uh, and I absolutely underline that. But that means that only organizing from the outset and being at the like lines of politics and ask for being invited, you need to fight to get in, you know, and, um, uh, and to do it now. And that means just simply uh, learning political strategy uh, and understanding that you have to organize not only with peers, but with allies. And um, not only with those who think the same like you, but also with people maybe representing other movements, but still share the common point with you. Learn political strategy. That's really important to get in. I mean, we all learn it. I can tell you uh, I learned a lot about it. And I can just say, if you want to get in a political decision-making process and you really want to make a difference, you need to learn how to uh, organize and how to get majorities and how to get in and put pressure on, uh, on parties and in parties. And that means being courageous, that means working hard, 
It's just like that, like that, you know. Uh, but I'd like to really encourage you to do that. We need that, uh, certainly. Last but not least, there is really positive uh, 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 views. I mean, you mentioned the possibility for 16 years already to go to vote for the European elections in some countries. If you look at the Polish elections just recently now, you can see a miracle. And it is incredible what is possible. Really, you have to look at that. More than 20% more young people went to vote. That is incredib an incredible moment. Someone tell me, told me never in democratic Poland since 1919 the share of voting was so high and the reason why it was so high was because especially the young people went to vote and they made a difference and they even uh, were more people going to vote in the share than the 60 plus generation. And the outcome is a complete different direction of this country, of a country which, to be honest, always was lost, uh, already was lost in, in many regards. You know, pe people really didn't have the face anymore to, uh, to really believe that there could be a different direction. And from today to tomorrow, there was a completely different scenario. That doesn't mean at all that everything changes from one day to each other, uh, because I can tell you nothing changes from the one day to the other uh, in terms of really changing structural questions. It's the, the opinion might change, the scenario may change, but to change the things on the ground needs time. But it is important to see that you can have that change and, and, and influence. And it's really powerful. So uh, be aware of the fact that it's not only um, uh, a privilege uh, for us to sit here, it's also a privilege to be part of the only 28% of people in the world who live in democracies. Um, and uh, be aware of the fact that uh, we carry responsibility to even really get engaged also for all the others who are not. Thank you. Thank you. So here's the motivation. Uh, grab your phones, please, for the last question on our Menti round regarding the elephants in the room. So, what's your own elephant in the room, guys? Can I say corruption? Yeah, cancel culture. <laughs> Accountability, diversity. Hopefully, we'll tackle some of those in our next panel discussion. So, let's have a short break and see you in half an hour. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.